Uh, hi, the biggest change in about the last 10,000 years actually happened quite recently. And that was when we as people went through the clouds, not just with building, but with technology. Currently, we have total connectivity. Everybody on the planet is connected. We have over 6 billion mobile phones, over 6 billion mobile phones. That is 2.5 billion more mobile phones than toothbrushes. More people have phones than access to toilets or drinking water. And within those uh, 6 billion mobile phones, we have 1 billion smartphones. That is a total change, because this number of 1 billion smartphones was reached in only 6 years. So the smartphones are just going to school now. They are very, very young. It's only six years since we reached that. Never before te did also technology spread so fast. It used to be that only the rich people can afford it. Now everybody can afford a phone and a smartphone. Technology is basically everywhere. What is the effect of this total connectivity? Well, one big effect, obviously, is progress. When things change, you move. When you move, you go forward in whatever direction, and that is progress. What is progress and what drives progress? Progress is not how smart you are, said an article in Scientific American this month, but how connected you are. If you are the village with the smartest baker, all you can do is bake. If you are a village with an average baker, average shoemaker, average theater player, average fisherman, you have much more progress because this connectivity will create new things. So when you create progress, you do that often where roads connect. Most of our cities are built where roads did connect or rivers connect. So connectivity is where progress happens. In cities, um, crossroads make those cities, and in cities you can exchange goods, even if you don't have money, as we heard today. In cities you can change ideas, even if you don't come up with the idea, but there are people around you with ideas. And today the city is basically happening online. And that's why we call the city of today Digital urbanization, we have digital cities. You can live in a totally remote town, even on an island or even on a ship, and you can connect to everybody. You have basically everybody connecting to you. That's digital urbanization. Who are the citizens of digital urbanizations? Currently, or last year in 2012, we had 51% machines online. So online, the web that you know is populated mainly by machines but still there's 49% humans. So that look at the humans and how they live. So from those humans that are, make the internet, uh, they, the big thing obviously is that through a machine they are connected to the internet. And that changed us. There's this famous saying that says, first we invent technology and then this technology reinvents us. It reinvents the way we work, the way we live, the way we perceive stuff. And it also changed the way a target group is. What kind of people are they? We used to talk about Generation X, Generation Z and stuff, and now we talk about a generation that's called Generation Connected. Generation Connected is not a demographic. It is not an age, it's a lifestyle, it's an attitude. And actually, with Generation Connected, 60% of those people are offline for less than one hour a day. We used to switch off the phones at night. Now a phone is the last thing we look at in the fr at night and the first thing we look at in the morning. 68% of managers get extremely nervous when they cannot check emails at least every half hour. You might know that when you work and there's a meeting, the people have to check the email. 10% of people find it okay to check messages while having sex. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. <laughs> Generation Connected also lives in the now. The messages are immediate. There's no more patience. I, I just uh, SMS with my son, who is uh, very far away, and I got nervous when I didn't get an answer within eight seconds. So you basically live in the now. Now is very, very important. WhatsApp and stuff like that, all those things work now. Uh, I was in Los Angeles recently and there was a big research done at the university uh, in Santa Monica actually about technologies that teenagers use, 10th grade technology. And they do not use stuff like Facebook anymore, they use other things like for instance Snapchat. I don't know if you know Snapchat, but Snapchat lets, lets you share information for seconds before they self-destruct. So you can take a photo and seven seconds later it's over. This trend is so big that it has a name. The name of this trend is nowism. Nowism is very emotional. 
That's why if you look at messages of kids, it's mainly lol, goobl, smileys. It's not information, because it basically is just an emotional connection. Now is it's very emotional, and that's innate to us. When we are born and we cry for mom, all mom has to do is to say gulu, 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 no information. And the important thing is that this gulu, gulu is fast, much better than half an hour later, oh, are you feeling well? which is appropriate sentence, but it's too late. What is an emotion? An emotion is not happening in us. If you look at the word, it moves the world around us. So when the baby cries, the mom and the dad come to the baby. So the baby influences the world around it and makes the people come to it. Emotions are very big drivers, and now we have digital emotions. Emotions are also uh, a part of not only humans, but of everybody. There's a famous writer called Kurt Vonnegut, and in one of his books he said, what do two birds say when they say, cra, cra? And what they say is, I'm here, me too. And then they feel good. And when you write an SMS, I'm, I'm home in five minutes, there's no information. That's stupid information. But the emotion is very, very relevant. So the emotional content basically just says, I love you, I'm thinking about you, whatever the content is. So we are now communicating emotionally. Nowism is also very trustworthy. If you have a bad grade, a C in America is a bad, not so good grade, in math, on a report card, which is a trustworthy um, document, and then somebody says to you, oh, he got much better in math. Without any proof, you trust that person. Why? Because that information is now. So you trust uh, iffy inf inform information that is now more than a stamped document that is old. So nowism is very, very trustworthy. Nowism is also very attractive and effective. If you sell stuff and it's only cheap on the weekend, Black Friday offers and stuff like that are 500% more effective than if it's uh, cheaper all the time. So if you're a salesperson, lower the price for only a very short amount of time and five times more people will buy your product because you have the fear of missing out. Nowism is also addictive. We have all the mobile phones in the pocket and the mobile phones is constantly pulling us and saying, hey, hey, hang on, hello, stuff happens and it happens now, check it out now, there's stuff happening. You're sitting here but on the Facebook wall stuff is happening, emails are happening, much more interesting than the talk. So everybody has to look at what is happening and they have the fear of missing out as I said before and that's why certain people cannot function without mobile connectivity. I know people that have major difficulties taking a shower when they're waiting for a call or a, or a message because they're afraid that they might miss that message if it's an important one. So it is very, very addictive. We therefore crave ever more connectivity. It's not that we say now connectivity is enough, we want more connectivity. Uh, if we want connectivity between devices, we basically want the information that's on our laptop to be on our mobile phone, to be on our tablet and stuff like that. If that wouldn't work, we would be very, very unhappy. So the connectivity has to be within the devices also. That is inside the actual device. So consumers, this is a research from this year, are focusing on fewer multifunction devices. It used to be that you buy a telephone that can just call, a radio that you can just listen to music to, a TV that does TV. Now you want everything in one. If your TV is not connected to the web, you say, what kind of a TV is that? I'm not connected to the web. If your iPad couldn't show uh, TV stations, you would say, what kind of a uh, tablet is that? You basically want everything in one device. And as there's also major connectivity within us. We are hardwired for connectivity. And I want to show you this one example that proves this. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing.
So that basically means we don't have silo organs. We don't have just a hear, an ear that just hears or an eye that just sees. We connect all those things. So we are itself, in, in ourselves hardwired for connectivity. And that's why it's very easy for us to immediately love connected, connectivity devices and jump on it in such an amazing speed. Uh, Connectivity today is a discriminating advantage. That means if you are not connected, it's bad. I give you an example of a discriminating advantage. Those are hospitals. The hospitals in Holland, uh, this is a Dutch example, have amazingly good machines and very, very good doctors. And, but they're still competing. And how do you make the people come to your hospital? What they first did is they said, it used to be that hospital is like this mini jail. You're in the hospital, everybody else is outside. So we need to connect with the outside world. The first thing they did is if you have a premature baby, you're, the baby's in the hospital, you're at home. But now there's a camera in front of the baby and you can see the baby at home on your iPad and you can say, gulu, 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 I love you, and connect with the baby. The next step was that basically there's information, when does a, the person I love wake out of the anesthesia? What can that person eat? Can the person eat meat or just uh, soup? Can I bring flowers or is it too dangerous? When are the other people visiting? Does the person want visiting? How much time? Ba 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 ba. So basically what happens is that you are connected to the person in the hospital and the person in the hospital is connected to you. And if, that, if a hospital does not have that, you say I'm not gonna go there. That is a discriminating advantage. So hospitals are competing not on better machines, but on better connectivity. If you take that to products, what kind of a camera would be a better camera? A camera that makes better pictures? No need anymore. We take very, very good pictures. But often we don't know what to take pictures of. So a camera that is connected to the world and would show me, hey, here in Istanbul, 200 meters to the left, 500 meters up there is a very beautiful photo opportunity. A camera that would tell me that would be much more better. So the smart product basically tells me photo opportunities. There's a big parade, there's a beautiful flower market, go there. That camera is superior to a dumb camera that can just go click. And if I were to buy a bike, and the bike were to tell me, and I could tell the bike, when it's sunny, wake me up 10 minutes early so I can ride you to work, if I live in where I live, <laughs> it is possible. That is a smarter bike, and the bike basically connects to the weather, connects to me, writes me an SMS and say, hey Dietmar, remember, uh, you wanted to ride me to work, don't be lazy, ride me to work, and I appreciate that. So a smart bike is better than a dumb bike that I just can pedal. That's smart products. Connectivity gives us power as people. If you look at all the recent revolutions that happened and that changed the world and changed policy, it's all because of connectivity of people. They came together due to devices they had. Connectivity gives us more powers as consumers. We used to be extremely weak as a consumer. There was the brand and then there was a consumer. And if you look at the Latin word, it's the opposite, con, contra. So the consumer does the opposite of what a brand does. A brand talks, the consumer listens. A brand knows and the consumer learns. The brand sells and the consumer buys. That's the only thing you can do. But today that is changing and today you have a brand and a prosumer. And the word pro means you do the same thing that the brand does, only even better. You're better than the brand. So the brand talks, but as a prosumer you talk more than the brand. There's actually today 86% of people talk online about preferences, what the product they like. You can never afford that in media money. You can never buy that many conversations. So the people talk more about you. And if they don't like your product, like this case, the big crystal for her pen is a very famous case, and the people made fun of that. And like, just look at the last sentence here, Ask your husband for some extra pocket money so you can buy one today. That is an insult to the pen and still 6,000 people found it important. Uh, so basically, if you don't like the product, you trust those people. If they don't give you the stars, you will not buy the product. The brand knows, but you as a prosumer know more than the brand. You know how much a flight is with another airline. The brand used to say, this is the best product and this is the best price. Now you say, no, it isn't. Look, there's a better product for a cheaper price. The brand knows the, how, if the Four Seasons Hotel in Istanbul is really nice or not. In fact, it is very nice. <laughs> but um, if it weren't nice, you would be more, less like a dog that gets the information and eats it. You're more like a cat that goes out and hunts for information and drags the dead 
spread into the living room and says, look, this is how the rooms look like for real. <laughs> so you as a prosumer know much more than the brand does. The brand sells, but the prosumer sells more than the brand because you trust people like her that do her eye makeup more than the information of an advertising. 42% in the world of people trust ads, and 97% of people trust the opinion of other people. So if this person says Revlon is really good, you trust her more. Because they are amateurs, and amateurs means they do it out of love. If they were professionals, they would do it out of profit, but they do it out of love, and that's why you trust them. So where do people connect? I need five more minutes, and I'm relatively in time. They connect mainly online. Online is where you connect. What is online? Well, basically, to look at stuff, whoa, this is really loud, you have to know where it all came from and um, it, how it all began. And online basically began with the year zero AG, and AG obviously means after Google. So Google made online. Before that, it was just for academics. Google made online. Google was about knowing stuff, about finding the information, about selecting it, and then about receiving the information. And the way to do that is via Google, okay? Like, I know that there's a TEDx, I find the information, I select, I don't want to know when it is, I click it, and I get that information, okay? Google is still very, very strong, and Web 1.0 still rules, but one thing is happening. If you look at this, you will notice that Web 1.0 is aging very, very quickly. And one of the main problems of Web 1.0 is that you have to know what you're looking for. Take my son, my son is now 10, and he, would, once, he used to live in a kid's room, and now he wants to have a cool room. So he Googles cool room, and this is the picture he gets. He was relatively frustrated, so he Googled really cool room. <laughs> That's the picture he got. That's totally frustrating. The solution is called digital anticipation. Digital anticipation means that we know what they are looking for. And basically, you have to know your customers. If that is my son, by the way, A, if he looks like that, but even if he looks like Halo trailers online, and you know that because we all leave digital traces, and he buys South Park shirts, and then he reads articles about Call of Duty, then a cool room is less like this and much more like that and you simply have to know that. That is called digital anticipation. Know your people and know that. So your internet is completely different from my internet. We all have completely different internet experiences because the information we get is catered to us. We are, we are individualizing the internet. After that came Web 2.0, Facebook rules. It's about creating the information. You shoot the video, the YouTube video. You write the report, broadcasting it, sharing it with uh, connecting to people and sharing that information with other people. But you create the contact. That is what Generation Connected is basically doing. Uh, and that is very, getting very, very big. I don't know if you know uh, Meet and Seat by KLM. It's where you choose on an airplane this person you sit next to linked, uh, due to their LinkedIn or Facebook profile. So you sit next to people that have the same interest. I don't know, you might know that Fiat Mio is a crowdsourced car that was built online by thousands and thousands of people in Brazil, and it now exists. So that is basically uh, the generation-connected approach. I'm as much your brand as you are, says the prosumer today. I can deliver as much of service as you can. Allow me to contribute. Four more minutes. Web 3.0 is a personal upgrade. It's absolutely individual. It, we connect with everything. If I am looking for a McDonald's, I don't know where McDonald's is, I want to push the McFinder and I have to get a fast answer. And it has to be very, very easy. If it's too complicated, I won't do it. That is actually called excess cost. If I were to have to look up in a phone booth, find a phone booth, look up in a phone booth in a telephone book where a McDonald's is compared to a map, I would never do that. If I just push one button, I'd do that. So total connectivity, lowering access cost, gives me access to the world. It's absolutely individual. Uh, Web 1.0 would say there's so and so many McDonald's in, in Turkey. The McFinder says, I'm, you are now here as the only person on the planet, and the McDonald's relative to you is there, absolutely individual information. The device is disappearing. We all know um, 
the connect where you just go like this, you don't feel the device. We know the t-shirts that basically send the doctor if your heartbeat is still working, and we all obviously know Siri. And Siri is basically artificial intelligence. The technology behind is artificial intelligence, and what people say now is that basically the iPhone will probably be known as the father of Siri. So the iPhone will die, but Siri will stay. The iPhone is a device, but the device will go away, and we will all be connected. If you look at Google Glasses, that's the first human machine interface that you actually wear constantly. So we are becoming cyborgs currently with glasses, very soon maybe with implants. Web 4.0 is total transparency. We know all everything about products. You can take photo of the barcode and know if there are peanuts in there, and if you're allergic to peanuts, you don't buy that, right? We know the prices. We take a photo, and it will tell you how much the product is everywhere else in the world. We know the behavior. This is one of those graphs that basically everybody in this room has about what they did online. We know what you do online, and we know the emotions. There's a technology that basically tells your gender, your age, if you're happy and sad. Basically, Steve Hawkins now has a new input. He used to have an input that could do one word uh, per minute. He has a new input that reads his emotion, retina dilution, and stuff like that, and now it's much, much faster. And that basically leads to the thing that we will be emotionally connected to our devices within a few years. Our devices will read our emotions, and they will see uh, if we are tired or happy. This is basically... Uh, happening right now. There's also Nekumimi, you might know, that measures your brain waves, and if you're sad, your ears go like that, and if you're alert, your ears go up. Uh, transparency of everything. In the future, will be Web 5.0, that's what everybody's working on right now. The total connectivity, you might know, in the Mercedes cars and stuff like that, where the people basically look at your retina and tell if you're, if you're tired or awake. If you're awake, they shake you up. Very soon, there will be a person that might say, you're tired, you know, buy a coffee, it's, you get 50% cheaper and stuff like that. We will be connected to traffic in total. We will see cars that are coming, even if it's foggy. We will see kindergarten teachers because they're wearing information, even if it's dark at night. This needs, leads to the connectivity of things. Currently, if I want to have uh, um, dinner, I have to call the concierge. Why don't I call the chairs? Soon you will call the chairs, and you will tell the chair, I want to have you and you at 8 a.m. tonight, and then I will get a warning, it's time is running out, come quickly. So very soon, by 2020, High Tech Magazine says, we will have 50 billion connected objects online. So the last thing I want to share with you is the pyramid of connectivity. It always goes up. First was the Web 1.0, the sender connects with the receiver. Web 2.0 is the people connect with other people. Web 3.0 is we connect everywhere with mobile devices that we can bring. 4.0, we connect with the invisible, with what is the ingredient, was it produced nicely. And Web 5.0, everything connects with everything. This will bring is the trend, and it will always go up to the top of the pyramid. So connectivity is progress, so connect now and create progress. Thank you very much. Dietmar. Thank you. Need to say two things. First of all, I thought you were a TED speaker. Are you <laughs> or not? I am. Well, you know, you kind of I went know, I know, I four know. minutes, I know. and now I'm in trouble with America. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, going to I was say... actually thinking maybe I spin <clears throat> the information down, okay. but I think I make the it second for you. Thing, the second <laughs> thing to the audience, this is going to be podcasted. You can stop and watch and stop and watch because it will probably take you 40 minutes to understand <laughs> what they said. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. But thank you know, you. it's, I mean, the clicker is here. This is, this is moving. Thank you.